Well, thank you everyone for joining us uh, today for our continuing uh, series of science sharing webinars. Uh, today, uh, we have uh, Jeff Chapman from uh, Sioux Falls, who is, has a number of co-authors on this. And he'll be talking about nocturnal convection over the Eastern Plains and kind of what are the environmental conditions that are favorable beforehand, so you can kind of get a handle on what's coming up. Okay, with that, uh, Jeff, it's uh, all yours. Good morning, everyone, from Soggy Sioux Falls. We're glad we're dealing with uh, rain today rather than snow from a week ago. And I'm kind of hoping that the uh, topic of the uh, presentation today will entice the atmosphere into some behavior that's a little more typical uh, as we go into the early part of our uh, warm season around here. Uh, specifically today, we'll be talking about the environmental conditions which are favorable for initiation of nocturnal convection uh, across the eastern plains. And this research was done several years ago, and it was part of a Comet-sponsored uh, project, uh, which I did in conjunction with our Sue, uh, Phil Schumacher. Uh, Matthew Dukes did a lot of the legwork with the project. He's now associated down with the National Weather Service office in Pleasant Hill, and Dr. Robert Weissman uh, up at St. Cloud State University. Why did we do this? Uh, that's probably the, the, where we have to start from. And if you go through and, and read any of the regional or synoptic climatologies that have been published in the literature, uh, you'll see a lot of differences regarding the nature of the nocturnal convection across this part of the country. In fact, uh, we had some research done locally in our office from back in the 80s that uh, I'll give you a little taste of later on in this presentation that tried to show some of the differences in, in convective natures across the area. Also, we all are very familiar with the social aspects of getting our information out to our public and private partners. And uh, no more so is that evident when we start talking about the need to get that information out during the nighttime cycle. Uh, once that evening news is over and people are tuning out of the activities of the day, uh, there can be some very significant weather that occurs with nocturnal convection, some very large hail. Uh, a lot of our significant damaging wind events occur at night, and uh, we can even get tornadoes from time to time. The most recent around our area, anyway, was the uh, uh, shelter, or the Sibley tornado back uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, that was an EF4 that occurred during this nocturnal period. So it's very important if we can get an idea of something that can help us get a heads up on what might be coming um, through a, a, a climatological type of study like this, uh, it's a good idea uh, to do that kind of research, and that's one of the, the larger motivating factors that we had. And then finally, anyone who has forecast convection uh, in this part of the country uh, know that challenge for uh, forecasting initiation of nocturnal convection. The models have their ideas uh, on how this will develop, and uh, I've seen it be very different from that many, many times. So just to try to anything that will give us a heads up on, on what to expect uh, with nocturnal convective development in our part of the world, uh, we considered that a, a very valuable uh, research topic. Now, what did we do for an area? Well. It would have been nice to say, all right, we're just going to take uh, the northern half of the country or the eastern half of the country and, and, and deal with it in that way. But uh, as you'll see when I describe the process a little more in depth down the line, uh, we had to be kind of focused on, on the area that uh, we chose or else we would still be looking at data you know, several years later, I think. But we defined our study area here as an area between 94 degrees and 101 degrees west la longitude and 42 and 46 degrees north latitude. And that pretty much covers eastern South Dakota, southwest Minnesota, northwest Iowa, and north central in the northeast Nebraska, an area that's very, very familiar with uh, nocturnal convective development. What did we do? Well, we decided uh, in order to define nocturnal convection that we would go back to one of the elements of convection uh, that's, that's absolutely necessary. Uh, in this case, we're looking at lightning. And we acquired some National Lightning Detection Network data over about a six-year period from January 98 to uh, September 2003. This data was provided by uh, Dr. David Schultz down at the National Severe Storms Laboratory uh, in Norman. 
And we use this data uh, in order to, to make our determination about nocturnal convection. Uh, this data was in gridded form imported into GEMPAC uh, so we could do some analysis on it. And then what we did is broke that study area down into quarter degree by quarter degree boxes. So uh, in each one of those boxes, uh, for every hour, and that is every hour of that almost six-year period, uh, we gridded up the lightning data, the cloud-to-ground strikes, in each box and uh, did a tally in each one of those little quarter-degree by quarter-degree boxes. Then the next goal was to set a criteria for what we call nocturnal convective initiation. And why initiation? Well, we didn't want to be dealing with convection in, as in some of the, noct or some of the uh, studies, uh, the climatological studies, that indicated they thought most of the nocturnal convection, if not all of it, was an was a artifact of the storms that developed across uh, the lee trough of the Rockies or over the Rockies themselves, progressing eastward in the overnight period. Uh, that was one of the earliest studies on uh, nocturnal convection in the northern plains. But we wanted to look at the actual initiation of convection in, in our study area. And to do that, uh, we set a temporal criteria of this initiation occurring between about uh, 0200 UTC and 1400 UTC. So in the warm season, between 9 PM and 9 AM. Now, uh, we had to set a criteria for a significance, uh, a threshold of the number of lightning strikes we needed uh, in order to define a nocturnal development. And we decided that uh, 10 plus strikes in a three-quarter degree by three-quarter degree box uh, would be a sufficient uh, criteria in order to uh, filter out those, those one strike here, one strike there, uh, mid-level uh, ACUS type developments that really don't account for much of significance. And then we also had a criteria for continuity that uh, we had to have the, that criteria of 10 or more strikes occurring two consecutive hours within the study area. So the quarter degree by quarter, three quarter degree by three quarter degree box you can think of is nine of the little grid boxes uh, that we had, had divided the area into and uh, counted up the lightning strikes in each one of those. Now, because we had a, a box uh, that we were studying uh, between the area um, 94 west to 101 west um, and then 42 to 46, there are edges on that box. So it's possible that that three-quarter degree by three-quarter degree box could stray outside the area. If that's going to happen, that's all right, but we required that a majority of the strikes in that three-quarter degree by three-quarter degree box would occur within the study area. Now, there has to be some uh, overlap or adjacentness to the three-quarter degree by three-quarter degree box over those consecutive hours uh, so that we can talk about the same storm and not a development here and a development there and something more random, uh, a little more organized activity. We also uh, insisted that there was going to be no lightning strikes in that box in the previous two hours to that time period that we use to define development. And I'm going to go over a case uh, in just a second here that will kind of uh, show all these uh, criteria in play. And then finally, uh, there can be no lightning strikes uh, in that box or uh, an adjacent box in the current or previous hour that can be traced to a time that's prior to our nocturnal time. So again, we're trying to filter out those storms that are moving in from outside our study area, and we're focusing just on that development component. So how did we go through a process of defining convective initiation? Um, again, I think Matt did most of this work. Uh, and if he's on the call, he can, he can probably uh, nod and smile about the time that he put in doing this. Uh, but we basically had to go through and view hour by hour yeah. by hour for that whole six year period. Uh, to figure out which were cases and which were not. So here's a case uh, from the 29th of August in 1999. Uh, this is the 0200 UTC image, and you can see uh, there are no cloud-to-ground lightning strikes at this time. An hour later, we now see many areas of development, and 
each one of those numbers is plotted in the center of one of these uh, quarter degree by quarter degree boxes. So you can picture there'd be a grid of nine of these boxes in a square, uh, three by three, where we, will, where we would be counting uh, up the uh, number of lightning strikes. And you can see in the green circle that we're dealing with uh, 10 lightning strikes at this point in time. There are 14 in the, in the blue circle and up to, I believe that's uh, 60 in the red circle up here. Now if it's three by three, the third tier of that box is gonna be in our study area. So that technically would be all right. Uh, but as you can see, most of the lightning strikes are actually outside the box at this point. Are we gonna get enough continuity requirement now with that second hour? Surely we do. Uh, this box over here, the, the, or the circle, the blue circle has 11. Uh, many more in this green circle here. And finally, the red circle has enough strikes, but all the strikes are outside the box. So the blue circle will meet the criteria that we set uh, forth in that previous slide. The green circle will also meet that. But the red circle, with most of the strikes outside, does not meet the criteria. OK. So after all this work uh, in defining what our convective cases were, we wanted to have a parallel set of data that what we called null cases. And in this case, null is not exactly what you might think it means. Uh, null, for us, would allow convection to occur within the study area, but dissipate by 0400 UTC. We wanted the atmosphere to be convective but not to the criteria that we set it for. Uh, we allowed convection to occur within a degree of the study area all through the nocturnal period between 2 and 14, but did not ex enter our area with one exception. If something happened to wander into our study area, it would have to end up with less than 10 strikes and then dissipate within an hour. Uh, that way, again, it's a, it's a convective producing environment but not one that fits our criteria for being a null case. So after we did all this, uh, identified our convection, uh, we could grid it up by bins as far as where, the, uh, where and when the convection occurred. When did it occur? Uh, looks like there's a couple of distinct peaks in nocturnal convective activity over that period. Uh, initiation mainly occurring between 3 and 4Z uh, over here on this left side of the chart, a secondary maximum around 8 or 9 Z. And if you used a little imagination, maybe something toward the end of the period uh, around sunrise, 1300 UTC or a little after. It was kind of interesting uh, looking through some of the uh, research that was done in this office here. Uh, forecaster Richard Ryerholm had done a study of warm season convection. Uh, Thunder reported at Sioux Falls between 1952 and uh, the time he did the study in 1988. And it's a little hard to see here, but uh, it turns out that his peaks in thunder reported at Sioux Falls occurred at about 4Z, 9Z, and 14Z. So even though this was only warm season and it was only for one site within that box, uh, it did show the similar uh, nature as what our study showed, which was a positive thing. Uh, where did this convection uh, break out? We can go in and we can assign uh, convective initiation points by the center point of that 9 by 9 box uh, at each full degree latitude and longitude point. And this is the result if you count up all those convective initiations uh, over our domain. Now, it's not as simple as just looking at these numbers and saying, wow, you know, there's a maximum that occurs somewhere out around the Missouri Valley in central South Dakota, and then extends east-southeast toward northwest Iowa. Uh, the raw numbers say yes, but we have to do one small thing mentally before we, we do that comparison, and that is to consider uh, what we have for uh, our uh, numbers at each one of these points. If you were in the center of the domain, uh, this the, the numbers represent uh, all the convective initiations within a half degree of that point so that there's no overlap and each number is a, is a unique element of that larger domain. So all 16 uh, of those 
half de or quarter degree by the quarter degree points are within our study area, which is fine. So the number is representative of, of what really occurred. Now let's suppose we are out on the edge of the domain, uh, on, an, uh, on an edge, not on a corner at this point. Only half those grid boxes, uh, of those quarter degree by quarter degree grid boxes, are actually in the domain. The other half are outside. So uh, those points would technically only contain half the data that any of the interior points do. And that becomes further accentuated when you go to a corner when only a quarter of those grid points are counted. So if you really were lo looking at this figure, uh, you would have to double those points on the edge and quadruple the value of the points on the corners in order to uh, actually see uh, or make a, a valid comparison of the, of the spatial coverage of initiations. Now, this was a very, very arduous task. And the result of our analysis was that we found out that uh, we had nocturnal initiations uh, that developed over 265 days of that nearly six-year study. If you were to average that out, it's about 44 days per year, uh, which if you limited only to the warm season, uh, that's about once every four days or nights, I suppose, would be a better way of putting it, uh, during that warm season. To further break down uh, our analysis, we went in and correlated severe weather reports out of storm data and looked for those events that could be correlated to uh, the locations of these nocturnal developments in order to classify them as severe, of which there were 72 ca or 73 cases, or non-severe, uh, which was 192 of our cases. And remember how we went through and figured out null events uh, as well. Those occurred over 187 days uh, of, the, of the study period. Here's a lot of text on this slide, but uh, now that we have our events defined through the use of lightning data, uh, we're getting almost to the point where we can start to pull together some conclusions. And in order to get something that will help us in the forecast process, we went and created composites for each one of these breakdowns, for the severe, for the non-severe, for the mean, and for the null cases. And to do that, we used uh, NCEP reanalysis data uh, provided by uh, NOAA, OAR, ESRL, uh, PSD, and Boulder uh, off the website. And the website is listed on this slide uh, right here. That data is provided on a 2 and a half degree by 2 and a half degree lat long grid available every six hours. And because it was available every six hours, uh, we had to try and figure out which data was the best to use with each initiation because we could have convective initiations between 2Z and 14Z. Uh, so what we did is we assigned what we called an initiation time for each individual case uh, to put in the composite. And that was done by basically the proximity to the available data time. Uh, we went the two, three, two to three Z times assigned to zero Z, four to eight Z assigned to six Z, and nine to 13 Z assigned to 12 Z. And then all this data was, was composited. Uh, again, all mean cases, all severe cases, all non-severe cases, and null cases. And to try and help with the interpretation, some difference fields were computed uh, between mean and null and severe and non-severe. Uh, and again, we'll be presenting those uh, in just a second. And uh, the composites were computed at initiation time, at six hours prior to initiation time, and 12 hours prior to initiation time um, for possibly giving us a view of what we can see uh, six to 12 hours ahead of uh, these particular uh, nocturnal convective developments. So the next series of slides that uh, we're going to see here uh, is a comparison of the convective or all severe and non-severe put together uh, compared to what we call the null cases. Again, a reminder here that null is not no convection, but it's convection that does not meet the requirements that we had set forth in that earlier slide. Um, and again, I have to, have to say this up front, that if you came here today uh, expecting to see some uh, grandiose uh, silver bullet uh, as far as being able to 
this is when nocturnal convection is going to develop and, and it's clear and it's perfect. Uh, that's not what we're going to get. Uh, what you're going to see today is everything you expect to see when you're considering nocturnal convective development. But I think the, the thing to pull out of this is the fact that we are actually going to see those signals showing up in a composite analysis rather than looking at a case-by-case -case analysis. Uh, the fact that it shows up with a composite uh, is a good thing. So we took that data from the uh, composites uh, into GEMPAC, and it was available on all the mandatory levels. And we were able to go through and produce a number of composite analysis at these different mandatory levels. And as we'll see in a little bit again, um, it will, we are also, because it's a gridded data set, we're able to do some uh, more diagnostic quantities on, on this as well. Uh, starting near the surface at 1,000 uh, millibars and uh, looking at mean sea level pressure, uh, all these cases, uh, slides that you see coming up in the next short term are going to be uh, the same structure with the null composite uh, up in the upper left, the all or mean composite in the upper right, and then the difference fields between the two uh, are mean less null down across the lower right and lower uh, left uh, images. So the important thing to pull out of this first slide, the, the low level fields, is that the mean composite, that, that, re, that, re, that reflects the development of nocturnal convection cases that fit our criteria, ends up with a stronger signal of a cyclone in the Western Plains. And that shows up in the, very clearly in the uh, mean field in the lower left, where the sea level pressure is much lower uh, in the composite over the west, and a stronger ridge uh, in the right uh, part of the image over the Ohio Valley and toward the east coast. Uh, likewise, the lower atmosphere is much warmer in the mean cases than it is the uh, null cases, uh, four to five degrees Celsius warmer in that case. And that would be uh, upstream and into the study area. If you creep up just a little more toward 850 millibars and uh, look at the temperature and height fields, uh, the same type of signal will show up in that uh, a stronger ridge in the east, uh, a little bit of more troughing with negative uh, 10 decameter or negative 1 decameter uh, height differences through the uh, Western Plains and Rockies. Uh, and again, that very much warmer lower atmosphere at 850 millibar showing up in the middle part of the plains just upstream and extending into uh, our study area between 4 and 6 degrees Celsius now difference between the composites. At 700 millibars, the same uh, type of structure starts to show up uh, with a couple notable differences, which I'll mention here in a second. Uh, we have, again, that 4 to 6 degree warmer atmosphere at 700 millibars and a much stronger ridge located uh, over the eastern part of the, uh, the uh, country compared to a more trophy and more zonal signature uh, in the 700 millibar height fields of the null. At 500 millibars, uh, again, that, that trend continues. Again, you see in the composite of the mean cases a stronger rig, ridge signature through the center part of the country with height differences uh, considerable, up to 7 decameters uh, over the eastern part of the study area. While there's a little bit of a trough, again, like you saw in 700 millibars uh, in the mean moving through with the null cases. Again, trough would suggest some lift. Uh, and you did have convection going on in both these cases, but not as much in our study area in the null uh, set on the left. Another thing, interesting thing to notice is the thermal difference between the null and the mean case has reduced a little bit now. It's 2 to 3 degrees Celsius warmer at 500 compared to that 4 to 6 degree uh, Celsius that we saw in the uh, at the 700 millibar layer. So that temperature difference is actually weakening somewhat uh, as you go up. Much warmer below 
and a little bit less warmer when you get up into the mid-levels. Well, what does that mean in terms of, of some stability profiles? We can look at the 700 to 500 lapse rate because this is gridded data now. Uh, we're not limited to just looking at some of the base fields. We can actually do some, some diagnostics on it. And it turns out that the mid-level lapse rate or that elevated uh, mixed layer that we speak so often of uh, and look for with convective events turns out to be between a half degree and a degree Celsius per kilometer steeper in those composites uh, for the mean cases versus the null cases. So in the situations where we get the nocturnal convective development occurring in our study area, we have a steeper mid-level lapse rate in and upstream of our study area. We can go up to jet level, and there's some pretty significant differences once you get up to jet level. Uh, again, the mean composite in the upper right, the null composite in the upper left, and you can see a great difference uh, between the location of the jet in the mean composite versus the null composite. The stronger ridging that we saw in place in the, uh, the mean case has resulted in a northward location to that strong upper level jet up along the Canadian border, while in the mean case we can see that the jet core is much further displaced much further south and actually is somewhat weaker uh, than in the, the uh, mean case. In fact, the difference in the wind speed uh, up along the Canadian border is as much as uh, 20 to 25 knots uh, in comparison to what we had in the, in the null case. And you can see, just looking at this superficially, that that is going to have a lot to say about uh, where the respective jet entrance and exit regions are located and what those uh, ageostrophic uh, motions as a result of that jet are going to be across the area and where those are located. I hope these pictures are actually uh, keeping up with everybody uh, with the internet here. As a result of those ageostrophic accelerations and those height differences that I mentioned before at some of the lower levels, uh, there is a significant difference in the structure of the low-level jet uh, at initiation time in each case. In fact, the mean case has a much stronger low-level jet uh, across the central plains. Um, and a little more southerly uh, orientation of that low-level jet than the null case, which has it more deflected off to the east, a little more veering going on. And that would make sense if you go back and think about uh, where that position of the mid-level trough was located at 700 and 500 millibars being right over or shifting just east of the area uh, right around initiation time. In fact, uh, this is the difference in wind speed in that low-level jet. Uh, up to 5 meters per second, about 10 knots of uh, wind speed difference uh, located upstream of our study area. So you can picture the, the convergence and the lift which is occurring over the area uh, inferred from that low-level jet. Now again, it's, it's a, uh, we have all the data available in the gridded data set, so we can not only look at temperature, but we can actually look at theta e which is, is kind of nice because within theta E, we get an idea of what the potential instability is uh, with this air mass uh, that we're dealing with in each composite. Uh, one thing to note is that in both composites, in both the null and the mean, they both have a theta E gradient across the study area. But that theta E gradient is much stronger in the case of uh, our nocturnal convective case composite, the mean composite on the upper right. Now we saw a stronger low-level jet at 850 and a stronger gradient in theta E in the composite. So therefore, uh, not only do we have higher theta E as much as 10 degrees Kelvin higher in the mean cases versus the null cases, but we have a focus of stronger advection of theta E occurring across our study area at initiation time. Uh, that is significant 
in that it'll, it infers that there's greater potential instability to that air mass, especially when you combine that with the, uh, the mid-level lapse rate difference that we looked at between the null and the mean cases before, in that uh, there was a, a almost a, a half degree to a degree increase uh, in the mid-level lapse rate versus uh, the null case that we looked at before. We can also do some rudimentary Q-vector analysis uh, because this is a graded data set. So I looked at a couple different level uh, of Q-vector. 250 millibars are in the upper. Again, we're looking at the uh, mean case on the right, the convective case on the right, upper right, and the upper left would be the null comparison. So right away you can see uh, kind of a reflection of what we saw in some of the mid-level height fields and the upper level height fields before in that the uh, wave, the forcing for lift in this case with the negative div Q right over the study area at initiation, or this is, uh, excuse me, this is six hours before initiation time now. This is the only uh, image that, of that series that actually isn't right at initiation time. But you can see that the wave is already, uh, the forcing is already over the area six hours prior to convective initiation. Uh, and then for the mean cases, uh, that strong forcing remains off to the west upstream of the area. Now, if you focus down low at 850 millibars, the forcing is in relatively the same axis uh, in both images, maybe a little further east in the uh, null cases. But at low levels, there's not a significant difference in the forcing for lift. So we have, again, an upper level wave, which is across the area with its forcing at six hours prior to convective initiation, while at low levels, uh, again, the forcing is already in place. If we step up to initiation time, uh, we can really see clearly now that the forcing with the upper level wave has shifted off to the east of the area, just lingering in that far eastern part of our study area, while the upper level synoptic support for the mean cases, for all those nocturnal initiation cases, is just moving into our area. Uh, likewise, the low-level forcing in the mean cases has strengthened over that window and is still located in our study area, while for the null cases, that low-level support for lift has shifted off to the east. So if you think about it from a tropospheric depth per, uh, perception here, um, you end up with Everything's shifting off to the east in the null cases, but we still had convection around. But in the mean cases, everything is really starting to come together, and you can see the impact of the upper level and the lower level, especially if you think about what that intervening atmosphere is like between the upper levels and lower levels, that we saw that that lapse rate was steeper, and that infers an easier communication between the, the features at upper levels and lower levels. So that's a quick run through of the, uh, the mean versus the null case. And now we thought it would be interesting to take a look at some of the findings for the severe versus non-severe, because that's probably one of the more significant things we want to be able to, to maybe get a heads up on is, are we in, in a situation where we're gonna, going to see uh, a potential for significant severe weather in our, in our nocturnal time frame? Because the more notice that we can give people, uh, the better off everyone is. And again, you're not going to see anything earth shattering. Uh, in fact, overall, what you will see is all those signals that we saw, uh, which differentiated between the mean cases and the null cases, uh, it's actually going to be just stronger signals in the severe versus the non-severe case. So I'll probably step through these a little more quickly than we, we did before, but I just want to give you an idea of, of what we're looking at. Again, all these series of plots are going to be very similar to the last. Uh, the non-severe composite is going to be in the upper left, the severe composite in the upper right, and then the difference fields between severe and non-severe will be located across the, uh, the lower part of the figure. 
uh, depending on what fields that we're looking at. In this case, it's uh, 1,000 millibars and the mean sea level pressure are lowest level fields. Uh, those two difference fields will be down there with the sea level pressure on the left and the temperature on the right. Again, we remember that we saw for the, the mean versus null that there was a stronger area of low pressure uh, indicated in the Western Plains. And it's even more evident when you break severe and non-severe up uh, out of that mean in that you have a much lower, much stronger area of low pressure, much lower heights in the Western Plains, and some more ridging in the east, and even warmer air at low levels uh, in the, uh, the severe composite versus the non-severe composite. At 850 millibars, similar uh, structures, of course, but again, warmer, lower heights to the west. Uh, and that's all I'm going to say about that. That's my Forrest Gump for the day. Um, at 700 millibars, again, the, the overall patterns, again, similar, very similar to the mean that we saw before. But again, stronger warming at 700 millibars. And that continues all the way through the surface, that you have warmer temperatures in the severe composite, warmer perhaps meaning more instability. We'll see that in a second. And again, higher heights to the east, lower heights to the west, but again, not as strong as the difference between the mean and the null, but still a difference. 500 millibars, stronger ridging in the severe versus the non-severe. And the warming uh, is actually less evident now when we get to 500 millibars. And that's what we saw in the difference between the composite of the mean and the null. Remember that it was, it was warmer, and that difference decreased as we went up into the mid-levels, uh, again, the same thing is happening here. In fact, the resultant mid-level lapse rate, again, is somewhere between a quarter and three-quarter degree steeper uh, in the severe case versus the non-severe case. We're getting up in the mean now, uh, a lapse rate over the Rockies and into the Western Plains of up to eight degrees steeper per kilometer. And that's in a composite field. That's getting to be pretty good uh, when you can see signals like that. The elevated mixed layer is therefore more unstable uh, for those severe cases than the uh, non-severe cases. At jet level, uh, we see the signal that we saw for the mean cases with a strong jet located along the Canadian border. Uh, strong upper level jet is in place, but it is a little bit stronger in the severe cases with up to uh, about five knots wind speed difference across the area. But both are inferring of a, of a jet entrance type region uh, moving into the uh, western plains or the western part of our study area. At 850 millibars then, uh, with the slightly stronger height difference from west to east in the severe case and the slightly uh, stronger jet, we're getting a little more response through the, through the central plains with the low level jet, maybe up to five knots difference in the speed between the severe and the non-severe. And again, uh, a little more southerly component uh, showing up in the severe versus the non-severe. And that would also infer a little bit uh, into the shear fields. And actually, we're going to look at that just a little bit. We can do the same thing with theta e. Uh, look again. Again, both situations have theta e gradients across the area, much stronger in the severe case versus the non-severe case. And again, theta e values are 6 to 8 degrees C higher at 850 in the severe versus the non-severe. And because of the stronger low-level jet and the stronger theta E gradient, your advections, again, are also stronger. Uh, so what, is, what do we always look for when we're looking for severe weather? We're always looking for stronger signals, uh, clearer signals. And again, those things are showing up, nothing surprising. But the fact that a composite analysis is actually showing this is, is probably the most striking thing uh, of all. Again, higher theta E values in the severe cases imply a greater potential instability across the area. And you couple that with that steeper mid-level lapse rate, and uh, you're opening the door for more significant development. Again, I had inferred earlier, implied earlier, because of the gridded data set, we're allowed to look at all sorts of things. And we can actually compute a bulk shear from the low levels to the upper levels. Uh, and being most activity at night is elevated. Uh, if we take that lower couple thousand feet out of the mix and look at 925 to 400, we can get an idea, kind of almost an effective shear 
uh, for our convective development. And this now is again looking six hours prior to convective development. And sure enough, uh, there is a difference between the non-severe bulk sphere and the severe bulk sphere, uh, about uh, three meters per second difference uh, across our study area. So the fact that our greater bulk shear is evident even six hours before development uh, is a, a good thing. And stepping up toward development time, those same signals show up. It may have weakened just a little bit uh, over that time period to two to three uh, meters per second. But again, if you look at it from a higher instability and a greater amount of shear combining the two, that gives you an idea that you're going to be able to get those storms to organize better, uh, to grow upscale, and to get more significant types of convection uh, because they were low, uh, we did correlate those with uh, severe weather reports as well. So all that put together makes a lot of sense uh, of what we're seeing. So I know I've shown a lot of things today, and most of them probably haven't been that surprising. But again, the fact that we could get these signals to show up in a composite analysis versus looking at a case-by-case -case, uh, issue uh, is, is a good thing, I think. Uh, there's a lot here. We have some future work that we're going to do uh, as far as getting things ready for publication. But um, we have some statistical analysis we'd like to do to see what our thresholds might be, what the significance of those thresholds might be. Uh, we're going to get to that uh, hopefully uh, this summer, especially if our quiet weather of late uh, holds on. So what you saw today, uh, an analysis of the mean and, and null cases after we had defined uh, what it took to be a nocturnal convective development. The mean cases uh, showed a stronger area of low pressure, lower heights to the west, with a stronger ridging occurring to the east. Uh, up from the surface through 500 millibars or so, it was much warmer. And uh, because that weakened as you went into the mid-levels, that difference weakened, that inferred a steeper mid-level lapse rate, which we actually went through and computed. And it sure turned out that it was uh, between a half a degree and a degree C per kilometer more steep. Uh, a stronger elevated mixed layer moving into the area. Uh, there was a potential temperature, equivalent potential temperature gradient across the area at low levels on both the null and the mean. But uh, that gradient was stronger uh, in the uh, mean case where we had the nocturnal convective development. And that uh, values of that equivalent potential temperature inferred that we had more potential instability, especially when you combine it with the last rates in the mid-levels. Uh, stronger low-level jet resulted from that height difference and from the uh, difference in the upper-level jet structure. And then that resulted in stronger theta E advection, one of those things that we look for uh, when we are forecasting nocturnal convection. And then finally, uh, the large-scale forcing was actually moving into our area of study uh, in the mean cases versus those null cases were that large-scale forcing was around but on the way out uh, at initiation time. For severe and non-severe, uh, basically what I had said uh, holds true, that you look for those mean signals, but only stronger in the severe versus the non-severe cases. Uh, we had deeper and stronger wind shear uh, in the severe cases, and more potential instability again, and which allowed for uh, more upscale growth and the likelihood of severe storms uh, with that uh, nocturnal development. That's all I have for today. I'm very uh, happy to accept any questions that this might bring up. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jeff. And any questions on his presentation today? Uh, this is Ron. Nice presentation there. I think you're kind of reinforcing some of the earlier work that was done, too, aren't you? And I see Jim Moore's work here a little bit with the action and the level jet, and uh, also a little bit of Bob Max's work, as well as some of uh, Usoni's work for Severe as well. Uh, I see a lot of good reinforcement from the earlier work that was being done by Jim Moore, maybe a little bit, and also Bob Max, and also Louis Usoni for a Severe Convection and so forth. Is that what you can kind of conclude a little bit there? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, like Jeff said earlier, there's really no surprises. It also kind of gets back to some of the early 90s papers that looked at the low-level jet development in turn, and its influence on, on nocturnal convection. Um, so it kind of just reinforces some of that work and just shows how it, it can apply 
to the uh, you know how it, how it applies to at least weather here in the eastern plains. Um, and just because it was over South Dakota, I, I think this, this is applicable elsewhere across the country. It's just we use South Dakota so that the signal would show up better by not having to move around around the country. You know that so that the uh, initiation point was in generally the same area and you wouldn't get a lot of averaging out. Yeah, that's true also as well. Yeah, you know, get a nice presentation. This is good. Thanks, Ron. Thanks, Ron. Okay. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Jeff, today for your presentation. Sure appreciate it. And thank you, everyone, for joining.